Oh man, it's so good. And that's what God is all about. He's all about changing lives. So if you're new to this church thing, if you're new to what this Christianity is all about, who we are and what we're all about is this is a real group of people who love a real God, a real Jesus who cares about you immensely. And uh, that's what we're here for. We're here because we love Jesus. We're not here because this is religious duty for us. We're here not because there's free, you know, food in the back, although that's awfully helpful. But we're here first and foremost because we love Jesus. And so we want to welcome you. If this is your first time here, if you're just kind of getting your feet wet in this Christian life, hey, welcome. This is what we're all about. We're not masking ourselves here. This is actually genuine joy. <laughs> Thank you for your excitement on that. Okay. <laughs> But this, uh, this morning, we're going to continue on our series, and the theme that the Lord gave us for this year as a church family is... All right, a little bit more excitement, please. We are moving forward. Are we moving backwards? No, we are going forward. We want to bring life, put life in a forward direction. Put it in drive, and let's get going. That's what we're interested in. That's what we're hungry for. Not only for us as a church family, but your immediate family, your families, your personal life. God is interested in moving us forward. Because listen, we are going forward. Right? I don't know if you realize it or not, but it's September 23rd today, 2018. We've never been this far in human history before. It is going forward. Your birthday is a day closer. Yeah, you're almost 50. Yeah, you're almost going to be 40. Yeah, you're almost 31. It's, it's coming. You're on the way. For those of you wondering, just trying to guess how old I am, it's just somewhere in there, all right? But uh, that's what God's desire and His plan for you and I is to move forward. And uh, we, we started this, I want to lay a little, again, some groundwork, and then we're going to talk about something new today about leaving our comfort zone. And uh, so if you've got your Bibles, go with me to Numbers chapter 13. And if you have no idea where Numbers chapter 13 is, it's Genesis is the first book, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Numbers. So it's the fourth book of the Bible. And you'll find it in there, and we're going to continue on just a little bit about this story, about what the Israelites went through. And uh, our whole moving forward talk, and just really emphasizing that God's got more for you. How many can agree to that? God's got something more for you. It's not just where you are right now, what you've experienced, the good things that you may have experienced, the successes that you've experienced, or even the, you know, the negatives, the things that didn't go so well in your life. God doesn't want to just leave you at those. He wants to continue to move you forward. Why? Because there's more for you. Don't ever settle. Don't ever have this mindset of, oh, I finally arrived in my walk with God and in Christianity. This is just what it is. There is more. Yeah. Say with me, there is more. Yeah. I'm believing that for this church. I'm believing, and what I mean more, I'm just saying, yeah, there's more natural things that are going to come to our way. But I'm also meaning I want greater encounters with Him. Yeah. That's my primary focus. I want more of Him. So how do I do that? And that's what we're discussing about moving life forward. That's what we're interested in. That's what we're hungry about. So, and again, this is talking about the children of Israel, the Israelites at this time. And, uh, you know, Israel was God's chosen people. And at this time, you know, and you can read through, you know, kind of your Bible. <laughs> it's be good for you. It's a really good book. If you read through it a little bit, you kind of find out that, yeah, the Israelites, they were in slavery for 400 years to the Egyptians. Now, these were God's chosen people. God chose a man, Abraham, called him out from the nations and said, With you, I'm going to start a brand new nation called Israel. And all of a sudden, there's your descendants. It'll be numerous. So here's this brand new nation that God is going to use to bring Christ, the Messiah, into this world to save us. And at this time now, the Israelites have been you know, in slavery for 400 years to the Egyptians. God brought them out supernaturally out of the Egyptian rule. I mean, you think about it. God, like the, the, the Egyptians tortured them. They would beat them. They would kill them. It, it was horrible. What they would do, they would kill their babies. It's, it's, it's horrible what was going on in the Israelite lifestyle. So God had something more for the Israelites, did he not? Yes. He's got something more than slavery, more than, you know, a life of insignificance, more than just a poverty-stricken life, more, you know, not having good relationships. God had more for them. And so he wanted to bring them to the mountain to go introduce himself to the people and say, hey, it's me, right? He wanted to show them who he was. And from there, he wanted to take them to this place where you may have heard called the promised land. And in this promised land, we're going to find out it is a land flowing with milk and honey. Anybody want some milk and honey? Woo! That's what I'm talking about. It's an abundant place. That's where God wanted to bring His people. So Numbers 13 gives us the account of now these he Hebrew children, these Israelites, are now looking on their, they're on the edge, and they're looking into this promised land. So and we'll pick it up in verse 17. It says this, Moses gave the men these instructions as he sent them out to explore this land. Go north through the Negev into the hill country. 
See what the land is like and find out whether the people living there are strong or weak, few or many. See what kind of land they live in. Is it good or bad? Do, they, do their towns have walls or are they unprotected like open camps? Is the soil fertile or poor? Are there many trees? Do your best to bring back samples of the crops you see. And it happened to be the season for harvesting the first ripe grapes. So, you know, if you could just skip to verse 23, it just kind of lays out, you know, where they all did, where they went, to, where they went. So when they came to the land of the Valley of Eshkol, they cut down a branch with a single cluster of grapes so large. It was a so large. So large. So large that it took two men to carry it on a pole between them. Now, I think Superstore is ripping us off. <laughs> You're paying $1.39 a pound for these little itty bitty grapes. All right. And the vine is heavier than the grape itself. Now, these grapes are massive. Two men to carry grapes. And these aren't sissy men, all right? They're not, you know. Okay. <laughs> Two of them on a pole between them. They also brought back samples of the pomegranates and the figs. Verse 24 says, The place that was called Eshkel, which means cluster, because of the cluster of grapes that the Israel men had cut from there. So the point that we talked about last week is God's got grapes. He's got more grapes for you. And that's what I kind of said, just exhorting and encouraging you and I, that we got to believe again. See what God has in store for you. See the grapes that God has for you. Don't, now you may have some good grapes in your hand now, but there is more grapes. But say with me, there's more grapes for me. God's got grapes. Has he run out of grapes? He said this to, to Moses as well, about a chapter earlier. He said, has my arm lost its power? No, it hasn't. Has it changed? Has he dwindled? Has he drawn back from mankind? No, he's gone forward. In fact, compared to the Old Testament, to the New Testament, he's actually not just among them, now he's with us. So he's here in a greater measure. These grapes are big. What grace is providing for you and I is bigger than what we could even ask or think. Ephesians 3.20 says that. Now it says, unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we could even ask or think. Yep. So I mean you got big dreams. Yep. Yep. Yes. All right, four of us. Okay, you, you got some dreams. You got some goals on the inside of you. Yes. Now guess what? This is the God that you serve. He is able. Say, He is able. He is able. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all you could even ask or think. Now it's according to the power working in you. But listen, he is able to do even above that. You got a dream, guess what? He can times that by the million. Mm -hmm. <laughs> think about it. We've kind of put God in this box and we kind of think, well, this is how my life is and this is what it looks like. So your expectation now is the level of your lid. Yeah. This is how high I think and that's kind of it. Well, God wants to <laughs> blow your lid open so we can start dreaming and thinking again. As the body of Christ, as church believing Christians, we ought to have the biggest mindsets out there. As I said before, you can't have a dollar mindset and reach the world with it. You can't. God is big and He doesn't mind going big. Aren't you thankful for that? We don't have a cheapskate God. We got a big God who longs to bless you. He's got more grapes. I always think there should be like a chant. More grapes. More grapes. More grapes. Okay. <laughs> Maybe that's just me. I kind of come from a sports background, right? So I'm always like, yeah, let's just... More grapes, more grapes, and just we'll go from there. So as we talked last week, going forward into new territory then, what is required? <laughs> oh dear Lord, okay. <laughs> In order to go into new territory, what's it going to require of us? A fight. All right. I understand you're not living this all throughout the week. This is what's on my brain all week long, so I'm, I got some sympathy. But honestly, fight. That's, that's, that's it. We are here. We have to fight for our future. And we'll continue reading in Numbers chapter 13, verse 25. I want you to notice where the grapes are, where the promises of God are, where these blessings of God are, the land that He wanted to bring the Israelites. Where is this land? And I want you to notice it while we read these next four verses. It says, after exploring the land for 40 days, the men returned to Moses, Aaron, and the whole community of Israel to Akadesh in the wilderness of Paran. They reported to the whole community what they had seen and showed them the fruit they had taken from the land. There, this was the report that they said. We entered the land that you sent us to explore, and it is indeed a bountiful place. 
It's amazing. It's beautiful. A land flowing with milk and honey. Here, look at the fruit. Now just think for yourselves. They're coming out of slavery. Right? And all of a sudden they see this land and God said, this is the land that is designed for you. I've purposed it for you, for your families, for your future generations to come. I want you to possess this land. Now let me just throw this in there for fun, but is it automatic? No. you got to fight for this stuff. This was God's will. He wanted them to have all of this. Right? And th these guys just showed us that. Look at the fruit it produces. Look at the land. It's amazing. Look at all this. Now note, look at verse 28. It says, But the people living there are powerful, and their towns are large and fortified. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Did we go to verse 20? Yeah, the Amalekites live there in the Negev, and the Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country. The Canaanites live along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, along the Valley of Jordan. The grapes are with the giants. That's where they're at. The promises of God, the blessings of God, where God wants to bring you, guess where it is? It's with the giants. So what do we got to do? We have to create this mentality on the inside of us of, I am in a war. Yes, grace has provided all of these blessings and promises of God. It has already provided it. But don't just think the devil's going to let you just kind of just take it and that's it. It's ill easy. You're going to have to fight for it. You're going to have to lay hold of the promises of God. Now, let me encourage you, in the Word of God, there are numerous promises regarding your entire life well-being. It's all in there. Meditate on these grapes. Pull a grape out of Scripture or out of the Bible and put it on so a place that you can see it. I want you to memorize that grape. Look at that grape. Think about that grape. Talk about that grape. Let this grape become the great, biggest, greatest thing in your life. Why? What are you doing? You've got to get the image on the inside of you. Because if the Bible says, by the stripes of Jesus, I am healed, that's what the grape says, then guess what? I have to now change my thinking to line up with this. What are we doing? We're focusing on all the prunes and the raisins that are out there that the enemy's trying to throw at us. Meanwhile, God's got grapes. And I shouldn't do this as a grape. I'm talking grape. <laughs> that's a little better. Here's God's grape. And the enemy's throwing you little, you know, little raisins. You know the trail mix that you get at Costco? You know, why do they put raisins in there? drives it's so very very frustrating basically you just look at the whole thing when I'm done with a bag of it it's like there's about a whole level of raisins at the bottom going basically what you're doing it's a hunt for the the peanuts and the M&Ms <laughs> and everything else can just lay low well <laughs> the enemy is constantly throwing these little raisins at you and I trying to get us off of <laughs> the grapes but here this is what's crazy people are believing the raisins they're spending so much time with the raisins, letting the raisins dictate their life, letting the raisins talk louder than the grapes. You know why? It's because as Christians, we become so familiar with church, so familiar with the Bible that we go, yeah, that's the God's, that's God's promise, but, but, but look, look at this raisin. Look at it. It's got just so many lines and it just is pruned up. It, they're so focused on the wrong thing. So this is what I want to explain last week is that our fight we're not fighting external things, but we, what, the, what we got to focus on is the grape. Don't get so caught up in what the raisins are saying, what the raisins are showing you. Get focused on what God is saying to you. Spend time with the grape. How do you eat a big grape like that? One bite at a time. <laughs> They're big. So you got to chew it one bite at a time. Make sense? Okay. So I'm going to just repeat this again. But we are developing a mindset that I am in a war. Can we say that together? I am in a war. I'm in, an, I'm in a war. And this mindset will absolutely leave you lifeless. It will steal away your joy. It will steal away the blessings of God. Is this, if God wants me to have something, He'll just give it to me. That mindset will wreck you. If God wants me to have it, then He'll just give it to me. No, no, no. Listen, grace has provided everything. Just think about your salvation for a sec. When you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, did you do anything to be saved? No, grace provided it, right? Grace already took care of all the work. Jesus hung on the cross, died for you and I, poured out all of His blood. Now what is your and my part? To respond to what that grape or what that promise or what He did on the cross for me. I have to respond to it. That's all my job is, is just simply responding. I believe that, Lord. And what's the result? Salvation came to you. It's the same way. Everything else in the kingdom of God works that way. God has given you these grapes. Now, in order to see it come to pass in my life, I have to now think this way. 
My soul has to be retrained to think according to God's grapes, not the raisins. Now, I don't know about you. Anybody interested in just thinking like a raisin? The first two rows aren't interested. Anybody else? I don't want raisin thinking. Raisin thinking is ridiculous. You can tweet that, all right? Put that in your drop the mic. Okay. Okay. So now I'm going to just talk a little bit here this, this morning about leaving our comfort zone. This is the next thing that I want to discuss with you, and Jamie's going to share a few things as well. Uh, but it would be pointless if we developed a mindset of I'm ready to fight for my future while living and looking to live a life of comfort. Now, <laughs> one of the greatest threats to not walking out the plan of God for our lives is looking to live a life of comfort. Now, what I'm meaning, I'm not talking about living in poverty. I'm not talking about enjoying the blessings of God. I'm meaning unwilling to step out in what God has called us to do. Yeah, we can fight for a future, but yeah, you can have this fighting mentality. But part of this fighting is me stepping out into it. Yeah. Right? Okay, and so let's just talk a little bit about stepping out. All right, we good? Yeah. Now, why do people like comfort so much? Because it's comfortable. Yes, wow. <laughs> we had our shreddies this morning, didn't we? All right. Why do people like comfort so much? I mean, there's lots of answers, and you could just yell at me. They're all, they're all probably true. You feel, you feel safe, right? What else? Anything else? There's no, work. there's no work. Come on now. No work. It's easy. What'd you, what's that? No demands. No demands. What's, it's just, let's just have a little chill out. Why, why, why this comfortable down here? It's safe down here. I enjoy it here. It's really good. I can put my feet up, although we forgot that part. It's just, I'm comfy. I can throw my slippers on, get my house coat on, and I, I'm just going to sit. I'm going to just chill. But why do people like comfort so much? And I want to, this was just a thought that came to me. But we like comfort for what comfort produces. Yeah. Comfort produces predictable outcomes. Yeah. Right. It's the same old, same old. You think, you do the same thing, what do you get? You get the same results yeah. constantly. Yeah. Right? Let me just tell you this. What comfort does not produce, though, in your life is growth and advancement. Right. Yeah. It's impossible. Comfort will never bring you growth, and it will never advance you. Okay. Now, I want to just share this quote with you, and I'll give you a couple examples. I love this quote, and I found it on, I don't know who said it, unknown author. Or you know what? If it's an unknown author, I'm just going to take it. <laughs> if you're thinking you're all that, don't want to put your name on it, well, I'll put my name on it then. All right. It says this, We all have comfort zones which determine what we believe we can and can't do. And if you are not being proactive in pushing your boundaries and getting outside of your comfort zone, you are effectively surrendering all of the possibilities that exist outside of your comfort zone. Should I say that one more time? Okay. It says, we all have comfort zones. You, me, we all got these comfort zones. And what it is is more of a mindset that we have, which we think we can and we cannot do. If you are not being proactive in pushing your borders and your boundaries and getting outside of your comfort zone, you are effectively surrendering all of the possibilities that exist outside of your comfort zone. Yeah. Now, I want to just give you a couple of examples just from my own personal life um, and uh, just some natural things and even just some, you know, supernatural things that, you know, God does. But even for my own personal self, I remember this and I want to, I think now that I'm a parent, I can appreciate the wanting to keep my kids comfortable. I, I can see that side of it, but I can see the advantage of actually allowing them to be discomfort, yeah. to experience it, to see it, right? Uh, because one, again, there's growth or no growth, advancing, no advancing. And I think my parents did an awesome job for me that way. I was pushed to continue <laughs> to go and go for it and step out and do it. And even if they, if even it hurt them, I don't even think it did. Maybe they'll just go. Let's <laughs> get, right? No, not actually. <laughs> She's tearing up in the front row. Right? You know, I'm just, but I remember I was 12 years old, and I was playing on, this, on the House League soccer team. Yeah. Now, anybody... <laughs> Eric hasn't gone past House League yet, so... <laughs> anybody know what House League means? It's mean we're just there to have fun. It's, co it's comfort. <laughs> yeah. Booyah, there it is. It's House League, so it was, a, it was a U12 league, and what it was, I would play for the purple team. I was Telebyte Communications. Giddy up. Right, and we were in the final game against Dairy Queen. They were the red team. And they, they were the mean guys because they had real bad mouths on that side. They, they were potty mouth, like DQ. You put a good, bad name on for them. Anyways, it's the purple team against the red team. And these two teams are going head clashing for the final of the U12 final, you know, small league game. 
There it is. The final. And I remember we were sweating, we're going, we're playing, and all of a sudden the score is 1-1. One, one. And all of a sudden, the end of the time hits, it's still 1-1. One, one. So the ref decides, all right, penalty shootout. All right, okay, so we got a penalty shootout. We line up all the guys, and our team lost in the penalty shootout. I boycotted Dairy Queen for the next month. <laughs> Should have, yeah. Oh, my dad really likes their strawberry milkshake, so we went there after the game. But, <laughs> but uh, I remember that. And so, you know, we lost the game. You know, you're distraught. You're frustrated. How could my purple team lose to Dairy Queen? Right? And you're thinking all these things. And I remember uh, my dad came up to me really happy. And it's just it's like we lost. But should I be spanked, put into bed then? Like for now? <laughs> I'm totally kidding. But... <laughs> I'm just trying to have some fun with y'all. That's all I'm just trying. Anyways, uh, he came smiling to me and he introduced me to a coach that I haven't met before. I didn't know who he was. So he introduced me and his name was Carl. Wonderful Austrian guy, had a thick German accent. And uh, this Carl guy just said, uh, like, you know, talked to me a little bit and, you know, I understood a little bit what he said. But basically what it came down to is he said, how would you be interested in playing for a competitive league for the rest of the summer with me? Yeah, that sounds awesome. All right, let's, let's go do this. Now, I remember they didn't have a practice that week, but it was the following Wednesday. I remember they had Wednesday evening practice. And sorry, it wasn't even a practice. It was more of a, it was a uh, cardio. We were, we were running that day. So I remember like, okay, I'm, like, I'm excited for this. Let's, let's get going. I remember showing up to the field, my dad bringing me to that field. And I remember the first time that I ever really felt truly uncomfortable was right there. Yeah. I play house league. I'm from Televite Communications. We just lost to Dairy Queen. I can't play competitively. These guys are, like, this is a U14, so these boys were about a year or so older. They're about 13, 14. And I'm this 12-year-old from Televite Communications. I have a player card. Do you want my player card? <laughs> I remember feeling so uncomfortable in that position and my dad encouraging me saying, go, let, let's get going. So what did that take? A step out of my comfort zone. What would have been comfortable? I'm going to just play with Televite Communications next year. We're going to beat Dairy Queen that next year. Yeah, that would have just been comfortable. But taking a step out, again, by doing that, I've opened up a whole new world where it brought my soccer career to an area that I would never have gotten to if I had not left Televite Communications. <laughs> so some of you are still stuck in Televite Communications. Step out of Televite Communications. It's great. I don't know all that they do still, but... They sponsored us. There's more for you. There is more. You want more of the grapes? You want the bigger grapes? You want to see what God's got for you? Step. Yeah. The next thing I want to share is my relationship with my beautiful wife. Now, Jamie being, you know, a smoking girl. Like, I looked at her and, woo, girl. She's good looking. She's ex like, she's, she likes the number eight. We both don't like seafood. This could work. I think there's something there. We met in Jamaica. And I remember we, my dad and I, again, we were out in a prayer conference in Surrey, B.C. And uh, I remember my, my mom, before I left, said, did you call Jamie? <laughs> no. Right? No. Plus, she's four and a half years older than me. Shh. I whispered it. I whispered it. I can't call a girl. She's 22. I'm 17. What do you mean I'm not going to give her a call? Right? And so I remember just finally we get to B.C. And, uh, you know, uh, my dad said, hey, are you going to call her? I'm like, no, I'm not. Like, no, we're at a prayer conference. I'm here to be with the Lord. <laughs> you're so worldly, Dad. Like, you're so, like, worldly. Let's, let's, let's pray together. And we just, no, are we, are, are you going to phone this girl? I said, no, I'm not going to phone her. Well, if you don't phone her, I'm going to phone her. So you can't phone her. You're married already. You can't do this. <laughs> you stay out of my potentials, all right? Leave her alone. So I remember he dialed the phone number and passed me the phone. <laughs> Hey, 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 what's up, girls? You know, what's your men's role? What are you doing? Didn't sound like that nearly at all, but it was more, you know, hey, you? <laughs> wow, it's you. Hey, hey, hi. I'm in, I'm in Surrey, and she just, you know, gracefully, and we said, do you want to meet up? So we went to... Dairy Queen. Red... <laughs> Dairy Queen. I just got my license and my allowance. Let's go to DQ, girl. <laughs> no, I was a little bit more classier than that. I thought I'd take a big step. We went to, what was the tickle? Red Robin. And what do you get? Clucks and fries for two. So we went and we had clucks and fries. And then we talked about this. And you know what that was for me? It was a step. 
<laughs> a huge step. Tell me about it. Then I visited her for a whole weekend, and my mom even telling me, you know, let's just get it. Like, I wouldn't go long. Because if this, if this turns out rotten, you want to get home quick. So yeah, I'm okay. So I bought a ticket late Friday night and early Sunday morning. So I, my flight was at like 5 o'clock in the morning. Just in case, you know, if she's a bit weird. Because <laughs> surely it's not on this end, right? Again, what is that? A step. I would not be married to the woman that I have today by not taking steps. It takes a step. Now, just from a, you know, just you know, stepping more into my own personal calling. I remember the first time that I ever spoke to a congregation. It was, a, it was supposed to be a, kind of a youth rally, but it was for the whole church. It was in Maui. July the 4th, Friday night. Joel, can you preach the Friday night service, Independence Day, in America? <laughs> yeah, that felt big. I remember doing that, and man, all of a sudden... Yeah, sure, no problem. And I remember that, that that was told me that morning that I was going to do that. That night came so quick. I remember looking at the clock. Are you serious? It's two. It's three. It's four. Oh, my goodness. Service starts in 20 minutes. What am I going to say? But you know what it was? I remember first stepping back here. You take a step. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> What's that? God, yeah. God bless America. I played for Telebike Communications, and I got a girlfriend. <laughs> but you know what that was? Again, it was another step. For Jamie and I, even in our personal life, and even you know, where we are today, I mean, when, you know, when Pastor John and Ingrid said, yeah, it's time for the transition to take place, why don't you guys take the, the church over? Boom. You think this is easy. I remember, so we just said, okay, let, let's do this. And so when that transition service happened, two, February 28, 2016, what happened? It was another step. Yeah. Another step into something. Yeah. And here we are today. You may think we know what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> you may look like, wow, man, these guys, they know exactly what they're doing. <laughs> I'm glad you think that way, and I will just leave that there. And you can do with it as you like. But all what I'm saying is every step opens up a brand new door. And not only that too, but I want to just let you know this. These seemingly natural steps that you take in discomfort, you're actually positioning yourself for God to reveal more of His grace that He has already placed on the inside of you. Yes. There is already so much on the inside of you that you don't even realize until you take the step. God just you know, affirm it in me. He ain't going to do that until you take the step. Why? Why? Because He's a faith God. You have to take a step in order for it now to be there. Yeah. That's how he works and that's how this thing operates. Everybody say, take a step. Take a step. All right. So I want to just encourage you. When was the last time that you were uncomfortable? When was the last time that you were uncomfortable? Now I'm talking about not being uncomfortable because of a stupid decision that you made. Like, yeah, you could be stupid and be uncomfortable. That ain't going to work. I'm talking about following God's plan for your life. When was the last time that you felt uncomfortable? You were in a position. You started serving in a part of the ministry. Or serving, you know, stepping out in a dream that God has for you. Where you felt uncomfortable? Perfect. It's exactly where you want to be. Because yeah. again, what does comfort do? Can you advance in comfort? No. no. What happens when you're in discomfort? Growth is the potential. Because yeah. if you think about it, discomfort, I can't actually predict my outcome. Right. It's unpredictable. So what am I going to do? I'm just stepping out, Lord. And that's what God loves about this whole thing. I'm stepping out. I have no idea what's going to happen. He loves that. Yeah. He loves that. Why? Because He's a faith God. And the Bible says that all those who put their trust in Him will never be disappointed. Awesome. Amen. Now, salvation's purpose. What is the purpose of our salvation? It is transformation. Yeah. The purpose of our Jesus' intention for our salvation was never comfort. Jesus didn't all say, okay, yeah, you accepted him as Lord and Savior. Oh, oh, thank God. Now I just, you know, I got, I got fire insurance. I ain't going to hell. Everything's okay. I can just sit back and I can just enjoy this life. This is not what he decided and what his intention was for you and I. Yeah. To sit right here. Hmm, this is good. Right in from this nice place I can judge. That is wrong. That is wrong. This is wrong. You know what? Get off your butt! Love you. Okay. I'm just going to read my notes here, right? Okay. <laughs> you know, I found this even in my own personal relationship with Jesus. I have never been once led to sit in a comfortable spot. Why? Because your walk with Jesus is transforming you. 
That's his intention. His intention was never for you just to, okay, that's it. Now you just sit down and just wait till I get here. That ain't it. Right? Okay. <laughs> Jesus will never lead you to a permanent comfort. And again, yes, he will refresh you. Yes, there's time for rest. Absolutely. Right? You can't just keep running, running, running. The antithesis to that is that, yeah, you just keep going, you just keep going. No, you need to get refreshed. You need to have rest. Why? So that God can put something on the inside of you for your next season. But you can't just be resting for the next five years. Like, come on, that's, that's a long time. Yeah. Right? God said, let's, let's go. Yeah. Let's get this thing rolling. Okay, and the scripture, just to back that up, just in case you're wondering if that's even scriptural, what I said. Romans chapter 8 and verse 29. I don't have it on the screen, but mark it. Let this be a verse. Like, this is one of the verses for me that I live my life by, knowing, okay, this is, this is part of my purpose. Like a lot of times people spend so much time thinking, okay, God, what are you calling me to do? What's my job or what's my calling? That's good to find out, but stick with what the word says first. My primary call is to be transformed into his image. I'm to look like him. Come on now, someone. Yeah, we all want, yeah, what's my next purpose? What's my calling in life? And that's all exciting, that's good. But it's impossible to find out if you keep looking like you. As long as you look like you, you're going to get you results. So he wants to transform you to show you who you really are in him and who he is in you. He starts to reveal things. So this is a call that you have, and it's Romans chapter 8, verse 29. It says this, For those whom he foreknew, talking about God, he foreknew you, meaning he loved and he chose you beforehand. He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son and ultimately share in his complete sanctification. That is God's desire for you. So if the church or believers choose comfort, the kingdom of God will never advance. And that can mean, I'm talking about taking a step out of your comfort zone in the job that you're in, in your family business. What can you do? What is God putting on the inside of you? What's your next step? That may look, oh, I don't know if I'm ready for it. Not sure if, I, if I'm able to do this. Well, listen, we also want to walk with his timing. We're not, we're not ignorant. Of, we're not just jumping into stuff and doing, ah, I'm just going to try it. No, there's a timing portion to this. There's working with God and all this. He's working in you, right? So again, because I want to give us a quick reminder. We are here on an assignment. We're not sent here by Jesus for a survival mission. This is what survival Christianity looks like. Oh, God, get me out of here. <laughs> The world is going to hell. Get me out of here. Yeah. Meanwhile, we're called to take over the world. Right. We're here to be the salt and the light. We're here to actually take over and to conquer what the enemy's trying to do. You got it in you already. Yeah. So are you taking the steps? Because it's in you. Right. If you read more in Romans chapter 8, it says the whole world is looking for the manifestations of the sons of God. Right. What does that mean? What's on the inside of you? You being just like Jesus, coming out for the world to see. They're looking for it. Right. They're desiring it. But as long as we as a church keep just doing this, oh, this is good. We're just, you know, let's just have our own little group. Let's just sing nice songs. Let's just, you know, have communion together. And let's just be us. That is not God's will. Never was God's will. Never will be God's will. Get up off our comfy chair. We got to get going. Yes. Right? Okay. So why were we saved by God? These are just three reasons, real simply, because God loved you. John 3, 16. Number two, so we could come into an intimate relationship with Him. 1 Corinthians 1, 9. You are called into a relationship with Him. Thirdly, is to join His mission and be a vessel for God to pour out heaven in this earth. You are heaven's vessel to work through and to demonstrate heaven in. Yes. Why you're here. That's why you're here. So let me encourage you. Don't get comfortable down here. <laughs> Don't get comfortable down here. And before I just give you a verse on this, you know, we, uh, this, as I was praying for these, this weekend, just this thought and this, this thing, phrase came into my, sin, in my heart. And it says, we get out of our comfort zone so that others may see him and live. <laughs> how are they going to see him? How are they going to know about him? How are they going to actually experience this God that we talk about who's so amazing when we're stuck in a chair? How? How are they going to hear Him? How are they going to hear about His love? How are they going to see His kindness in operation by healing their physical bodies? How are they going to see, you know, all the goodness and all of His kindness all in one shot? This is who He is, and He died for you if we're just hanging out in the chair. The world will never know. They'll never know. And meanwhile, the world is looking and starving for, so I need answers. We sang it. Nah heard a thousand stuff. There's so much stuff going out there. People are looking for answers everywhere. And what's the church doing? We're sitting on the comfy chair. We're just having a good time here because, you know, this is comfortable. I like this here. 
I know this, but the heart of God has never been comfort. Yeah. Never been. I know you're thinking about this, but you even just look at in the, in the Old Testament, you think of all these saints, all these people that experienced the presence of God. Were they comfortable? How about Noah building a boat for 120 years when they've never even seen rain before? Is that uncomfortable? <laughs> hey, loser, what are you doing up there? Building a boat. A butt? A boat. Oh, a boat. Why? There's been no rain here before. God told me. You look stupid. That's what's happening. But what, you know what happened? It wasn't moved by him. So what did he do? He kept hammering away and he built a boat for 120 years. <laughs> Abraham. Sarah. Let's talk about Sarah. You're going to have a baby at 90. Say what now? You're going to have a baby at 90. Me and Abe are going to get it on at 190? Like, huh? you got to be kidding me. What is it? Uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable. <laughs> think about all this. David, 15-year-old kid facing a giant. What is he doing? You think, oh, yeah, I know I got this. No, he is a man. Yep. At this time, he is a boy. And going, let's go. He took a step. Is that uncomfortable? I'm sure it was uncomfortable. Yes. Why, you got a trained giant ready to cut your head off. What is he doing? Bring it on. Same thing, Daniel, get thrown into the lion's den. Is that comfortable? No. Getting thrown into the fiery furnace, is that comfortable? No. But what happened every single time? God delivered every single time. Yes. When are we going to start trusting Him? Yeah. When are we going to actually just say, all right, God, this is what you said, let's do it. Yes. Regardless of what it looks like, regardless of what the bank account looks like, regardless of what the job looks like, regardless of what people are saying, this is what He said, I'm going to do it. The Apostle Paul, you're called to be an apostle to all the Gentiles. Huh? Man. <laughs> Are you like the, What? Are you serious? What do you do? Take a step on my missionary journey. Yep. The Apostle Peter, going to a Gentile's house. You could be killed for doing that. Uncomfortable. But because of that move, now us, we Gentiles, yeah. what do we got? We got the Word of God now. Yeah. Because Peter took a step. Think about this. You are not here just by chance. It is other men and women who died and were willing to take a risk of stepping out and saying, all right, God, I'm going to do this. Yeah. We're here because Peter did it. Yeah, that's right. You're reading a word now on your lap from someone who is willing to bring the word of God to the masses. He took a step of faith every single time. Whether he'd been beaten, shipwrecked, I almost out of his face. The guy took all these beatings, and here you are with a word on your lap. Why? Because he refused to let the comfy chair hold him. He said, I'm going to take a step. Yeah. Yeah. What is it? Your mission has got to be stronger than your comfort. It's got to be stronger. My purpose, my vision, my, what God has given me as a family, what God's given to us as a church, has to be stronger than my personal preference. Personal preference, you know what that is? It's the chair. But I like church this way. Get off your chair. Get off your chair. Find, you'll, you'll find a new chair up here. You can get comfortable over here for a little bit. Then we're going to change it again. That's all that it is. This is my personal preference. I like this. Leave me alone. I like my worship music. It's just leave me alone. Stop it. Kumbaya, my Lord. Kumbaya. Meanwhile, we're asking God. No, listen. We're asking God to show up and do something miraculous right here. He ain't here. He's over there. Do you see that? God, please, do something miraculous. Oh, God, just pour out your spirit on this place. God ain't here. Where is he? He's over here. He's in 2018. Now, i got to give you some time to preach here, so I'm going to just calm down. But we're going to... It's just coming up in me, but I'm just... We're going to have to... We're going to do a series on this a little bit later. Because we, we need this. We need these stretch marks. We need these. Okay, so I'm going to just close it off right here. Sweetheart, why don't you come up? Then I know I have a timer beside me. But I want to just again flip your mindset. <laughs> I want to flip our mindset that fear, comfort. Fear it. Be absolutely terrified by comfort. And at the same time, embrace discomfort. Right. Now, I've just taken on this for my personal self. But I want to actually start saying this my self-talk. You know what? It's not as scary as it looks. It's not as bad, it's not as scary as it may look. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to just boldly take a step and see what, what is in store. If you want something you don't already have, you have to do something you haven't already done. What's happening, if you get comfortable, even the way that you worship God, 
Even the way that you come to church. Is it the same old attitude that you come every single week? You know what's going to happen? Same old, same old. Something's got to change. I have to step out. Is it a step for you to raise your hands? Do it. Do it. And when you're on that verge and you start feeling uncomfortable, that is the best spot to be. Go ahead and raise your hands. If it's kneeling, is it going for a lap? Whatever it is, do it. It is worth it because there is so much more on the other side when you just step out. And uh, my, my sweetheart, Jamie, she's got some amazing insights, some um, things that the Lord's been teaching her over the summer that I want you to just, you know, give us. Thank you. Do it up. I think they're ready. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Primed and ready. All right. Well, Joel asked me um, to add in kind of the practical side, he said. Um, and I do just want to preface that with this man has been wonderful in my life to not only just push me, but shove me, kind of boot me out of my comfort zone. And so I want to say, find someone in your life who can do that for you. If it's not a spouse, um, find a friend who doesn't let you stay comfortable. Because as much as I'm like, mm, it's so good, right? It's so good to have someone who pushes you out. So thank you, honey. You. Pushing me out. Um, so a couple of the things that I'm going to share with you about actually practically getting out of your comfort zone. One is really to examine where your roots are. And last night, Joel talked about this. I was out of the room with London earlier today, so I don't know if he mentioned this. But looking at where you are rooted and grounded, if you are rooted and grounded in how comfy it feels or in your fear or in what someone thinks about you, if you're wrapped up in that as opposed to being rooted and grounded in God's love for you, then that's going to keep you tied constantly to your comfort zone. So I want to look at Ephesians 3, verse 17. They might put it up for you there. It's in the New Living up there. I'm going to read it to you from um, the Passion Translation. Um, we're talking about getting our roots to go down into what he says about us instead of thinking about what's someone going to think if I take that step out of my comfort zone. So in the, in the Passion Translation, it says, the resting place of his love will become the very source and root of your life. And then the verses after talk about then. So once your roots are right, then you're going to know and discover the magnitude of his love for you in all those dimensions, how high and wide and deep and, and long and all those things that God's love is for you. When you find out that your roots are in what he says, so often I say to myself, if I'm feeling like oh, I just want to stay here, like why don't I want to step out into that thing that's burning on my heart or that thing that, that Joel knows I'm supposed to do and has asked me to do? I often ask myself, Jamie, check your roots. Are your roots going down more into what people think about you or even what you think they think? Like, isn't that kind of crazy? <laughs> How dare we say, oh, I don't want to do that because of what Marie might think of me. Like, how do I know what Marie's thinking in her head? Well, she's thinking in French anyways. I don't know what she's thinking about me, right? <laughs> Pastor Laura used to always say, if you knew how much people actually weren't thinking about you, you'd be offended, right? So say this with me. Check your roots. Find out if they're going down into him. There's a line in a song we've been singing, and it says, it's more than enough that I'm loved by you. Talking about our father. So when you are fully rooted in his God love for you, and, and hear me, not you know in here, yeah, yeah, God loves me, God loves me, God loves me. No, you know it. You're living out of it. When you're rooted in, it's more than enough that he's loved by me, you're going to get that but out of your talk. You're going to get, I want to leave this comfort zone, but I don't know about the finances, or but I've never seen someone do it before. When you just say, God, it's, it's more than enough that I'm loved by you, and that's what is going to launch you out into doing that. I won't read it, but um, actually, Pastor Joel already did. The verse, the last verse in this series of verses is verse 20. That's when it says, now glory to God who can do all of these things above what we can think or imagine or dream. Well, read the verses before. It's about you being rooted and grounded in his love, and when you can do that, it launches you out into, yeah, he can do beyond what you can dream. But he can't do that even though he wants to if you're going to tie yourself to this chair, right? 
So let me read this to you. This is called The Antidote to Insecurity. It's from a book I'm studying called Crash the Chatterbox. And it's talking about how, you know, one thing that really can keep us there is feeling insecure. Feeling like, well, if I step out, what are they going to say or what are they going to think about me? And it says this, before you ever breathed, before you had the opportunity to show off or screw up, God declared, I want you. You're mine. I chose you. You belong. So let's put it this way. God has issued an announcement from his throne, and it's this. The audition has been canceled. He has not chosen you blindly, but intentionally. And here's why this is the best news. If this God chose you while knowing even the worst parts of you, then you no longer have anything to live up to. Instead, you're now empowered to live out of this divine acceptance. So here's the antidote to insecurity. You already have the part. Now you're invited to play your part. God has got something for each one of us in this room, and it's going to affect someone else's eternity. You and I stepping out is the key to someone else being set free. So isn't that enough to, to ask ourselves, well, what's tying me to this chair, right? Because you've got to start asking yourself that question, like, why, why don't I want to step out? I honestly spent most of my summer asking myself, there's things that I'm so passionate about doing and I see them in my future, but why am I a little like, mm, but I don't want to? You've got to ask yourself those questions. And when you know you've already got the part, then it's easy to step out. So I want to talk to you real quickly about the early church because when you look at, Pastor Joel mentioned a few of these things already, but when you look at the early church, they did not give a rip about what anyone said. They were like so far away from their comfort zone, they weren't even looking back. So far away that they didn't care if they were persecuted and beaten and thrown in jail. And honestly, in our kind of comfortable North America Christianity, like was anyone beaten on the way to church today? Was anyone persecuted at the doors for walking in here? No. So they are an amazing example for us because they were just so passionate about, about getting the word out about Jesus that they left that comfort zone entirely. I'm just going to read you from Acts um, chapter 4, verse 13. So this is after Peter and John were arrested for leaving their comfort zone, basically, and telling everyone about Jesus. And the, the group of people that arrested them, the council, they said, wow, what, like, what do we do with these guys? We are pretty amazed at their boldness. And we can see they're ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. But they recognize them as men who had been with Jesus. Hear that again. They recognize them as people who had been with Jesus. I honestly think that is the key to us getting out of this comfort zone. When you spend some time with him, spend time in God's presence for yourself not just here on a Sunday where we do it corporately, and you let him speak to you, when God gives you a word, it's kind of hard to get you off of it. You know, when he speaks directly to your heart, step out, do this. In my life, it's been um, different things about making my life more public. There's some writing that I do, and God often says, share that, and I that is honestly so annoying to me. I don't want to put stuff out there. I don't want to tell you that I just went back to the gym after months of trying to figure out how to make it work. And I say, I felt on my heart, someone needs to hear that, that just start someone, something. But when I, when God tells me to do it, because I have spent that time, I've been one who's been with Jesus, then I don't care to jump off of that chair. It pushes me off of that chair. These men had been with Jesus and that's why they got off of that chair. Um, and then I also just want to read a couple verses down in verse 19. You can read it for yourself later. It says, this is Peter and John speaking after they're like, stop talking about Jesus. Like, get back on your comfort zone. They say, do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? We cannot stop telling everything we have seen and heard about Jesus. When you become more passionate about God's plan, about the kingdom of God, about reaching someone else, you don't care what it costs you. You don't care how you look because you're more interested in someone else's eternity. And to me, that's kind of the mark of if you've grown up as a Christian. You know, if you're still sitting here thinking, well, I don't want to tell anyone in my work about Jesus because I might look silly. We haven't quite grown up yet. 
I want to be someone who says, I can't stay in my comfort zone. I have to tell people about Jesus. That's the road I'm on. That's where I'm headed. Not there yet, but at least take a step and go there. So lastly, I just have two um, really practical tools. Number one is decide whose opinion actually matters to you. Right? Stop holding and looking for other people to affirm you or confirm, oh, Eric, you're stepping out in that? That's, that's so great. Because I found a lot of the time that God wants me to get that from him. He wants me to get that affirmation or that, yeah, good for you, from him. And the times I have sometimes looked to my husband when I know I'm supposed to get it from God, he kind of looks at me like, yeah, fine, yeah, you did a great job. I'm like, tell me more nice things, pat me on the back. Right? And God's like, Jamie, come here. You have to care what he thinks about you more than what out here thinks about you. So stop fighting the need to confirm that people like you or that they like what you're doing. Right? Stop fighting the need to confirm that people like you or they like what you're doing. Um, because, and I shared this last night, um, I firmly believe that there's people in this church and in this generation, um, specifically my generation, that are supposed to hear from him and step out in it. And it may not look like what um, what Christians did a couple generations before us. One would be even just some of the way we present the word of God. Um, and I... I struggle with that because I look at what people have done before me and I go, how did they do it? Okay, if they did it that way, then I'll do it this way. I'm a, a working mom. Like, Joel and I pastor the church together, but I've looked like, oh, did, did someone else, like, like do ministry while they had kids? Like, is that okay? You have to get out of what did someone else do or what did someone else say because he's calling you to do the new Right? I think my kids are going to look at some of you guys and be like, oh, look at that example. But you have to set that new example. Right? I look to the previous generation for many things, especially Pastor Ingrid and Pastor Sheila as mentors in my life. But I cannot look to them to the point where I confirm like, oh, oh did she do it exactly that? Well, what's she wearing? I, I should do that. Right? Yeah. All right. So everyone say, decide whose opinion actually matters. And just, it's, it's him, right? And lastly, do it because you can't not do it. And that's what Joel was, uh, was talking about when he was getting his preach on. And I was just going to say, keep, preach, keep going. But I had to get out of my comfort zone and come up here too. So, so this is lastly, do it because you can't not to do it. When God tells you something, let it burn so passionately in your bones that you can't not do it. Have you ever had that feeling when you know you're supposed to respond to an altar call or when you know you're supposed to tell someone about Jesus and you're like almost sweating, like it's just so strong on you and then you just go home? Oh, I've been there so many times and my personality goes home and is like, what are you doing, Jamie? Like, it honestly, the turmoil you feel after when you're like, should have done, should have done, should have done, it's easier just to do it, right? It's easier just to do it. But what, what I'm saying is get so passionate about God that you can't not do it. Say, everyone, do it. do it. And I have to talk to myself when insecurity comes up, when I want to get back in my chair. I have to tell myself, do it anyways. Do it anyways. It doesn't matter what they say. Do it anyways. So you're going to have to talk yourself up in a few of these things, right? So I'm just going to close... Um, with this, oh yeah, this is what God told me recently. Hey, Jamie, you need only be mindful of what I'm asking you to do. <laughs> oh, yeah, good reminder. <laughs> I need only be mindful of what he's telling me to do. Um, so here's what I want to say lastly. When you know whose you are, when you know that you belong to him, then you will know who you are. And when you know who you are, then you'll know what to do. So if you're wondering... What is my first step to get out of this chair? And for all of us, it's something different. I mean, not, not many people, their step is that you're supposed to come speak on a microphone. That's just maybe someone. Maybe for you, it is getting out and talking to someone. For me, I love meeting new people. But know what I don't love? I don't love doing things that I don't know that A plus B equals C. So that's my getting out of my comfort zone. But when I know whose I am, 
And God tells me, you're mine, and this is who I made you to be, Jamie. I didn't put fear in you, Jamie. I made you brave, Jamie. When I find out who I am, then I know what to do. So that's just a reminder to really to just be one that spends time with Jesus. That is your first step to getting out of this comfort zone. I'm going to ask my pastor to come back up here. All right, let's do this together. Let's all stand up.